Hello everyone and welcome to an all new episode of Secrets in Dragon Ball Games. There are four different versions of Goku in Tenkaichi 3. Well, technically five. But we're not counting Kid Goku for this one. Early Goku, Goku Mid, Buu Saga Goku, and GT Goku. And each of the Gokus have a unique version of the spirit bomb tied to them. Early Goku, aka Saiyan Saga Goku, forms the energy in his hand and launches it at the enemy. This was the first and most primitive version of the spirit bomb. So naturally, it's the weakest. And the game very much reflects that, with it dealing a maximum damage of 14,010 damage. Riza Saga Goku deals a total of 16,040 damage. Granted, this version of the spirit bomb can reach up to 40,000 if you use the share your energy skill enough times. However, without using any skill hacks, this version will deal 16,040 max. The Super Spirit Bomb was the biggest one by that point in the series. Goku performed it in his battle against Kid Buu. It was the biggest and strongest one up to that point. And the same goes for Tenkaichi 3. The maximum damage the Super Spirit Bomb can output is 16,320. It's not that much stronger than the one used against Frieza, but it still keeps the power progression thing going. My guess is that they didn't want to make it too powerful in order to keep the game somewhat balanced. I always thought this was a neat little detail. However, I do have issues with GT Goku. See, GT Goku uses the so-called Universal Spirit Bomb. While it's the biggest and strongest version of the Spirit Bomb in the anime, it's the smallest in the game. I also believe Goku mispronounces it as Spirit Ball instead of Spirit Bomb. It does 16,040 of damage, same as the one used on Nemec. Kind of wish they continued with that power progression thing they had going on. It is the strongest version of the Spirit Bomb after all. My guess is that they didn't want to break the balance, or they simply forgot about it. In order to explain the significance of this next one, I'll have to give you a quick rundown. In BT3, certain characters have super armor. This is mostly reserved for giant type characters such as great apes and, well, Broly. This super armor can be broken if you're using a Super Saiyan 3 tier character, meaning characters such as Super Saiyan 2 Goku, Perfect Cell, SSJ2 Gohan, and so on can't break that armor without launching a few consecutive punches. Whereas characters above Super Saiyan 3 tier of power can break the armor instantly. <laughs> Now that we have that covered, let's move on to the main thing. SSJ3 tier characters might be able to break their super armor with a single punch. But their key blasts on the other hand... <laughs> Nothing. No reaction whatsoever. I even tried Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta, who's arguably the strongest character in the game. Again. Nothing. While it doesn't make sense power scaling wise, in terms of how this game functions, it makes perfect sense. In order to balance the speed drawbacks that come with being a giant, they were given key blast immunity. Meaning, giant characters will not react to key blasts thrown by regular, normal sized fighters. They will only react to key blasts fired by other giant type characters. And also, let's not forget. You can never surpass me. Broly's a literal beast in this game. Being an affected by Key Blast Stagger is kind of a big deal here. He's basically got all the perks of being a giant type character without any of the drawbacks that come with it. No wonder he stands in the league of his own in the competitive scene. We've already established that the fans weren't the only ones who liked to bully Yamcha. In one of my earlier videos, I mentioned how Yamcha is the only character who gets one-shotted by Cyberman's self-destruct attack, while everyone else just shrugs it off without any issues. Apparently, the bullying doesn't stop there. This time, we're going to Infinite World, the last Budokai-type game ever released. Infinite World has a couple of minigames, from running on Snake Way to Tien's Neo Tribeam Barrage against semi-perfect cell. The one we'll be focusing on is the Gravity Room minigame. Only a couple of characters can participate. Goku, Vegeta, Yamcha, Tien, and Krillin. All of these characters have unique shortcut scenes that play out if you fail to complete the minigame. Goku falls back, saying he should train harder. Oh man, I 
get to try harder next time! Krillin and Tien both kneel down while looking slightly exhausted. This training's really tough. Vegeta... Darn it! How did this happen? ...continues to be Vegeta. As for Yamcha... This gravity! I can't even move! They could have given him a similar cutscene as Krillin and Tien, but nope, they decided to clown on him once more. He's the only one who gets crushed by the gravity. Also, I like how they emphasize his struggle by adding that signature blank stare effect to his eyes. Worst part is that this isn't a game only thing. Similar thing happened in the show when Yamcha attempted to train under 300 times gravity. Oh no! What have I done? I also just realized that Vegeta trains in his Boo Saga outfit while this part of the game takes place during the Android Saga? Weird. Hey, in both Tenkaichi 1 and 2, Master Roshi is addressed as Turtle Hermit by the tournament announcer. Alright then, this is the start of the first round. Contestant Turtle Hermit versus Contestant Cell? Even Cell refers to him as Turtle Hermit. The first round is beginning. Turtle Hermit versus... Turtle Hermit being his title. Fun fact, Kame means turtle in Japanese. While it's not necessarily wrong to refer him as Turtle Hermit, I just find it a bit odd. I know Tenkaichi 3 included an Easter egg with Piccolo and Supreme Kai being named Majunior and Shin. Both are references to their world tournament aliases. But Turtle Hermit is not Master Roshi's tournament alias. His alias should be Jackie Chun, not Turtle Hermit. This was either a clever reference to his less used alias or an oversight by the localization team. My guess is that this was an intentional detail due to both Cell and the tournament announcer referring to him as such. I saw one comment from Mr. Jagger1407 that piqued my interest. He's a fellow Tenkaichi YouTuber who makes content on Tenkaichi 2's combat and mechanics. He mentioned Kid Gohan's skill, Hidden Energy, and was baffled how it doesn't do anything besides take away all your key. Naturally, I got curious. Surely there has to be some sort of upside to this skill. I booted up Tenkaichi 2, picked Kid Gohan, and activated the Hidden Energy skill. Strange. Nothing happened. Just like Jagger1407 said, all it did was drain away all of my key. I tried using it a couple of more times, but to no avail. Other than losing all of my key, nothing else was happening. At this point, I gave up and went on to test something else. About an hour later, I was playing with Yajirobe in Android 13. I was messing around with Yajirobe's skills only to find out that he also has hidden energy. I figured, what the heck, let's try it. At first, it seemed like nothing had happened. But when I got closer to Android 13... A lock-on? It was at this moment that everything became clear to me. What the skill does and why these two characters have it. Both Gohan and Yajirobe were specialists in hiding their energy. Yajirobe's most notable use of this would be his sneak attack on Grape Ape Vegeta. As for Gohan, much of his adventure on Namek consisted of him and Krillin hiding their energy against Vegeta and Frieza's forces. Hence, I believe that this is just a genius reference to their signature use of key manipulation. Population. From what I've seen, only these two have it. I guess they could have also given it to Krillin, but he has his signature solar flare skill, so there isn't much space left for hidden energy. Also, one thing to note, hidden energy only works if you're hiding behind structures. If the enemy has you in his sights, it won't do anything. I just figured out the best way to showcase the effect of hidden energy is through the split screen mode. Teen Gohan's second outfit has a subtle easter egg in Tenkaichi 3. I'm going to pull both outfits 1 and 2 up on the screen. Let's see if you can spot the difference. And no, I'm not talking about his orange gi. Did you notice anything else that looks off on the second outfit? Take a closer look at his hair. It's very subtle, but they changed his hair to match his Bojack movie appearance. They could have easily reused his Cell Saga hairstyle for this outfit and no one would notice. But they decided to go out of their way to make it accurate to his movie hairstyle. A simple little detail that's fairly easy to miss. 
Tenkaichi 3 has a couple of chargeable super attacks. You got Gallic Gun, Kamehameha, Special Beam Cannon, Masenko, etc. Like the name implies, you're able to charge them, and the longer you charge them, the more damage they will deal. Or will they? You'd think that it would work like that, but no. Tenkaichi 3 likes to do things a bit differently. First, I'm going to launch a Kamehameha with zero charge time. <laughs> Now, I'm going to charge it all the way up. And finally, I'm going to release it slightly before it reaches the maximum charge time. Well, isn't that odd? It did more damage than the one that's fully charged. What exactly happened here? It appears that Tenkaichi 3 has a hidden mechanic. And as someone who has played this game since its initial release, I only found out about it a few days ago. Here's how it works. While charging your Kamehameha, less than a second before reaching its climax, you'll hear a distinct audio cue, signaling the perfect moment to release your attack. <laughs> If timed correctly, your chargeable super attack will do more damage than a fully charged version of said attack. I've always heard the audio cue, but thought little of it, other than a simple sound effect added for some dramatic effect. I'm honestly surprised that it took me this long to figure it out. How about you guys? Did you just learn about it or did you know about it before? I was doing some comparisons between Tenkaichi 2 and 3, and while playing with Supreme Kai, I stumbled upon an interesting find. For the most part, both versions of the character play the same. BT3 did give him a unique rush attack, whereas the BT2 version of him had a simple stock rush attack shared by many of the in-game characters. For a character that barely fights in the show, they did pretty alright with his moveset. But here's the best part. The Tenkaichi games have these chargeable power attacks. You basically move your analog stick in any direction you want and hold the punch button. If done correctly, your opponent will be sent flying in the corresponding direction. In layman's term, if you point your analog stick up while holding square, your opponent will get kicked into the air. You point the analog down while holding square and he will get slammed to the ground. With Supreme Kai, they were probably scratching their heads trying to come up with some unique moves for his moveset. And that's when they came up with the most clever little easter egg. His down square combo consists of him pulling out a block of Kachin and slamming the enemy into the ground. A reference to his training with Gohan in the Kai world. I'm surprised they haven't made this a super attack. You know how some characters pull that giant rock and throw it at the opponent? They could have simply replaced the rock with a Kachin block and it would have worked as a super. Still, I'm glad it got referenced. Jumping forward to Raging Blast 2. Similar to Tenkaichi 3, you can home in on your opponent and dash straight to them. You since Raging Blast 2's roster is pretty much made out of BT3 characters, a lot of their moveset and animations got carried over. Dashing animations look mostly identical, except for one character. The devs were apparently big fans of Janimba's body dissolve teleportation and wanted to do something really unique with this animation. Here's what happens if you dash with Janimba. <laughs> He will disassemble his body into these tiny colored blocks and reassemble once you reach the opponent. A clever nod to his warping abilities. I was also curious if he would clash with other characters or just go straight through them. And to my surprise, he... <laughs> Clashes? Don't know why I expected him to go through. That would have been a bit broken. I have a feeling they also wanted to do this in Tenkaichi 3, but couldn't due to hardware limitations. It is a PS2 game after all. Really glad they included it in RB2. <laughs> Just a little quick update before we end the video. That Naruto video I promised is coming up next, so do be on the lookout for that. Also, these videos will be coming out on a more regular basis. No more waiting an entire month for a single video. So yeah, appreciate your support and I'll see you in the next one.